I think we can get started. We might have a few more people coming in, but want to be respectful of everyone's time. This is a lunchtime learning, so fully understand if people may be eating and off camera. Um, and I just want to introduce our two presenters. Uh, Karen Lindell, I had the pleasure of working with in her time as an attorney previously at Juvenile Law Center, and she is now a professor at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and Hannah is with us also, who is our Zubrow Fellow um, at Juvenile Law Center and previously a student of Karen's. So um, the, we brought this presentation today. Um, as someone who works in communications, I found that there are some pretty specific and unique challenges to doing press and work around lawyers and legal documents. So this is a skills building uh, session around that topic. Um, and there'll, there will be some time for, for some questions, but I will let our co-hosts take it away. Thanks so much, Katie. And it's truly uh, a pleasure and an honor to be back uh, with my former colleagues, so to speak, um, at Juvenile Law Center. I, as Katie mentioned, um, I was a Juvenile Law Center attorney for almost eight years before I transitioned into teaching. Um, and so I had the privilege of working with Katie. Uh, I got to learn a lot about how to work effectively with communications folks and how to improve my own ability to talk with the media and to um, effectively message our important work um, through, through media communications and other communications. Um, and then I'm so delighted to be presenting with Hannah, who was my student until last year um, and is now at Juvenile Law Center. And so this is just a wonderful pleasure and privilege for me. Um, and I am excited to share you know, what we've put together with you all and also learn some from you. So as Katie mentioned, we have um, opportunity at the end for questions. Um, but we also hope that that will be a time where we can learn from you and hear your suggestions also um, for how to allow lawyers and communications professionals to work most effectively as they message and communicate out um, important advocacy um, objectives. So with that, um, our learning objectives for this session are, um, first, we're going to tackle understanding legal documents. And I say that as a legal practice skills professor, I teach how to read and write legal documents. And I will be the first to admit that that is not always the easiest task, even for lawyers and law students. Um, so what we'll be doing is talking a little bit about the basic structure of opinions and briefs, some common themes that you might be able to find as you start to kind of decipher these opinions. And then we're going to actually do a little practice exercise where we practice quickly and accurately pulling information from um, a legal opinion. We're then going to transition to talking about effective techniques for working with lawyers. Um, so we'll identify some pitfalls, some thorny issues, as we call them, and then brainstorm, brainstorm some strategies uh, for how to address those pitfalls, offer you some suggestions, and then, as I mentioned, also learn, hopefully, um, some ideas from you as well. So working with legal documents. So I'm going to give you uh, in one slide and hopefully about two minutes what I spend a large chunk of the semester teaching first year law students. Um, and that is a, a basic understanding of the sort of formula or structure uh, that is very common to many legal documents. And by that, I mean kind of both judicial opinions that you might be trying to read and report on or describe um, and also things that get filed in court. So briefs or other types of motions or documents that, that the lawyers on your staffs might be putting together um, that you're reporting on or, or messaging out about. Um, so the formula that we teach students um, is that big uh, thing at the top of your screen there. We pronounce it CREAC. You don't need to, to learn it or remember it at all. Um, but it's a little bit of a behind the curtain view as to how to decipher what can otherwise be texts that, that don't necessarily make a lot of structural sense or read as very, you know, well written or, or artful legal documents. Um, so here, so, so this, the, the basic formula, as you can see up there, it's, it's, it's CREAC. It's the conclusion followed by the rule, the explanation, the application, and the conclusion. And um, what that refers to basically is the, the, you might have seen this in some of the documents you've read, um, lawyers like to say the conclusion right up front, they say the takeaway first, uh, and then they like to repeat it at the end. And that's true for both um, individual sections of legal documents, the whole legal document, sometimes even a paragraph within a legal document, it can lead to a feel of repetition. Um, but and, and I try to guide my students away from the super repetitive version of this, um, but it is a feature of legal writing is that the, often the very first sentence or the very beginning of a section says the takeaway as opposed to building to the takeaway. Then there's uh, the R and the E are both the explanations of the law or the legal framework, starting with high level rules and then moving to the more detailed explanation of the legal standard. 
Then you get to what we call the application, which is when the law is applied to the facts. This is what you are likely looking for. It's the bull, it's where the real meat of the legal analysis is happening, um, where the court or the brief is saying, here's what the outcome is should be here because of that law I just described to you. And so the, the real trick I'm going to try to teach you today is how to find that within an otherwise sometimes unwieldy feeling legal document. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we repeat that conclusion back at the end, um, hopefully in other words, sounding a little bit better. Uh, and oftentimes the final conclusion is the one that has the juiciest language. If you're looking for a quote from the opinion, oftentimes being able to find that final conclusion within the relevant legal section or section of the brief or the opinion uh, will be where you can find that best quote. Um, so I, I've mentioned most of this, right? But don't try to just read from top to bottom, right? You're, that's an exercise for falling asleep, exercise for getting frustrated, running, or just spending far too much time. I know you are all working on deadlines constantly, right? So skimming the document, um, but skimming it where you're, what you're doing is not just taking in every fifth word because then you won't really digest any meaning. But what you're skimming for is trying to find those juicy sections that have the meat of the analysis and the language that's most ripe for quoting. Um, throughout, you're going to see a lot of, you know, depending on the quality of the writing in the document, there might be a lot of legalese. Again, I try to teach my students not to write with lots of legal jargon and instead stick to kind of more plain English, understandable terms. Everybody appreciates that. Um, courts appreciate that. Um, but that you'll still find it in many, many legal documents. And so the tip there is just, you know, Google, if you really need to understand a term, just Google it, right? Like lawyers are dropping things in there just to sound fancy, but there's a meaning behind it. Um, and then overall, just just blow past it and, and find the things that you can make meaning out of and don't get, don't, don't throw up your hands and abandon all hope because of, of the legalese in the document. So I'm gonna pause my share for just a moment to um, uh, start showing you what I, how to actually do this. So we're gonna practice this skill. Now let me try to restart my share. Um. Okay, I hope folks are now see, oh, no, probably not. Okay, you should now be seeing, um, oh, no, it just loaded. Okay, now you should be seeing, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you, I see some nods. Um, a, an example of a judicial opinion. And this is really a, I shouldn't say run of the mill because it sounds a little derisive, but like this is just an average judicial opinion. It's not, it's, it's not badly written in my view. It's also not particularly well written. It's kind of average in a lot of respects. Um, and we're just going to use it as an example of how I would approach this as a lawyer trying to land on, you know, the, answer a question for myself like, is this helpful for me? Is this a case that I want to dive in a little bit in more detail on? Um, and in doing so, we'll try to do something, we'll try to locate that application, the places where you might find the best language if you were to be reporting on this. Um, so first, just looking at the top, right? This is called the case caption. Um, this is going to be there's going to be something that looks like this in an opinion at, or in briefs, really anything that's filed in a court. You're going to see, um, the, you know, the name of the case and the, and the court that the that that you're either filing in or in this case the the, the court that issued this opinion. Um, this intro material is a little deceiving, and different courts and different formats of opinions have different depth of this. Um, but this synopsis or background and holding, this is not written by the court. So first year law students get led astray sometimes when there's um, some, some courts have a, sometimes Westlaw or the, the legal databases that publishes opinions put a lengthier synopsis at the beginning or sometimes the court itself does. Like in, for example, in the Supreme Court, they publish a syllabus that is sort of a synopsis of the opinion at the beginning. And those can be very helpful. You can certainly take a moment and read them, but it is not, the, it is not part of the decision itself. And so for purposes of quoting it, you are not quoting the opinion if you're pulling language from that. And so um, that's a pitfall some first year law students often have. Um, but again, it can be helpful. It gives you a little summary. Uh, in this case, it's very minimal, um, not terribly helpful about the reasoning, but it does tell you a little bit about what we call the holding. The holding is the outcome of the case, what the judge decided or ruled in the case. Um, so then we get to these things, which is, you know, you start to read this and you're like, okay, infants, place of confinement, what's happening? These also, I would just skip past this if I was in your, in your position. These are in, put in, these are called headnotes. They're put there by the legal database and they're there uh, because some lawyers use this as a, as a way to um, more efficiently conduct legal research uh, by organizing things by topic. So what I would do is blow past all that and then you see where the opinion begins and it says opinion by Judge Donahue. This is where the actual text of the opinion begins. And now 
I'm going to read it by looking at the first sentence of each paragraph briefly, um, sometimes not even the whole sentence, but just trying to identify where am I in that CREAC structure that I just described. And again, I'm looking really for the application for when the court starts to say how this law should be applied to the facts here. So we have JM appeals from a dispositional order. I know that this is gonna be somewhere in here is probably gonna be a conclusion. And sure enough, because we conclude, I see down here that the language of the Juvenile Act prohibits such a result. Okay, I, blew, I went too quickly, right? I missed what, what's the result. Whether the juvenile court can impose a term of incarceration on a person over 18, but under 21. Okay, so a young adult, can you be incarcerated for a probation violation as part of a um, disposition in a delinquency adjudication. Okay, so someone who was adjudicated delinquent, presumably when they were under the age of 18, has now violated probation at over the age of 18, can they be incarcerated um, with an adult or in an adult facility? Um, and so I'm going to probably see the conclusion, but I'm not going to be able to make a lot of sense of it, right? We conclude that it pro the juvenile act prohibits that, so we vacate the dispositional order and remand. So that's that initial conclusion, but it's not very helpful for terms of quoting, right? It's kind of, it's just a form, like, here's, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna kick it back to the lower court. Then we're moving to what I will assume is gonna be some recitation, recitation of the facts. The record reveals that JM had a significant history in the juvenile justice system. Okay, I can see this is a factual description of, of what happened with this particular individual. Um, and I'm gonna skip that for now. You might skip it either because you already know the facts or because um, again, we're, we're looking for that application to see what the, what the outcome really is. So we have while on probation, okay, this is a continuation. I can see this is more of, there's a date. We're getting to more of the narrative. JM asks whether the Court of Common Pleas had the authority. Okay, this is now gonna be a summary of JM's argument, which is often what happens next in a judicial opinion. Um, JM's argument on appeal is straightforward. Okay, I might read this because this kind of helps me orient to what the case is really all about. He contends the Juvenile Act prohibits the detention of children in adult facilities and that because he falls under the definition of a child, um, pursuant to the Juvenile Act, the Juvenile Court erred um, by ordering his incarceration. For the following reasons, we agree. Okay, so I've got the holding now. I can see the outcome, right? The court said, no, you can't incarcerate um, this young adult because he presumably satisfies the definition of a child under the Juvenile Act. So you can't incarcerate him in an adult facility. But I do want to know a little bit about why, right? That doesn't, that maybe I'm trying to write a slightly more in-depth thing. So I'm going to keep going. Um, but remember what I talked to you about with the structure. The first thing the court's going to do is explain the law. And I don't necessarily need to get into all of the detail of what the law says if I'm trying to report on the outcome or describe the, the holding here or, or the real court's reasoning. And sure enough, we, the, 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 um, the decision immediately goes to, okay, this is a question of statutory interpretation. And here's how we conduct statutory interpretation as a general matter. And then we get to the actual provisions of the Juvenile Act. When enacting the Juvenile Act, here's what the legislature said we should do. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through this because this is all just the statutory provisions. Here I can even just see it from the formatting. This is the, the provisions of the Juvenile Act that are at issue. Here, um, in selecting from these alternatives, okay, we're still explaining what the, what the statute says. Um, and then there's a little bit of a summary here of these particular provisions. So you could pause a little bit if you're trying, if you, if you, if you feel like it's important to understand a little bit about what just happened. I can see now that this is, it's following all these big quotes. So this is the court's explanation. You could pause there, but I see there's even more statutory language. So I'm going to keep going. Um, and then I see something that jumps out at me. I see the party's name here. While JM clearly does not fit this first or third definition, this is the start of an application of the law to the facts. So I'm going to pause a little bit more at this part of the opinion um, and see what the court says. Um, so it looks like while JM clearly does not fit the first or third of these definitions, again, we didn't read the definitions, but let's see what it says he does fit. He fits precisely within the second definition. Prior to his 18th birthday, JM was adjudicated delinquent for the offense for which he was on probation and recently turned 18 and therefore was under 21 at that time. Um, as such, JM is a child pursuant to the Juvenile Act. Thus, under the unambiguous language of the Juvenile Act, the Juvenile Court was prohibited from ordering JM to serve a term of incarceration in the Clearfield County Jail. Do you see how that application and conclusion contains a lot more substantive information in it than that very first one that we got at the start of the opinion? 
um, we can see, and, and there might be something ripe in there for, for quoting or for describing if we were to be writing a press release or a, or a blog or something about this opinion. Um, so that's, this is really the nutshell of the reasoning um, in a lot of respects. And you might just stop there. I'm going to see what else is here just for the sake of making sure I didn't, don't miss something big. And what I see is the juvenile court does not dispute that the Juvenile Act prohibits com the commitment or detention. That's a sign. This is now a summary of the counter argument. The court's going to address here's what the other side said and why it's wrong. So you could take a minute and read that if you want to, or you could say, okay, I got the primary analysis already. I don't need to see the reason why the juvenile court was wrong. Um, but in any event, it's not terribly much longer. We're almost at the end of the opinion, right? And so what we do see here, and I, I'm in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to not go through this part. Um, but there is some interesting stuff about the practice, that this was actually a fairly common occurrence in this county, um, that young people were um, being sent to adult jail if they were over the, 18, over the age of 18 when they violated their probation, um, even though the Juvenile Act in Pennsylvania defines a young person who's still under 21 who has been adjudicated delinquent as still a child and children are not allowed to be incarcerated in adult facilities in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's my very quick um, uh, lesson on how to, to more efficiently, I hope, um, read a judicial opinion. And again, the same can be said, the same approach is you can use um, when you're, if you're looking at a brief, right? If your organization has filed an amicus brief or file or is representing a client and has filed something, um, the same basic structure applies um, with perhaps a little bit less summary of parties arguments and whatnot. Um, but, but you can use the similar techniques. Um, okay, I am now gonna hand it over. And I, I should mention, if folks have questions about that or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll take a look. I'm gonna hand the baton in a second here to Hannah, um, but I'll take a look and we'll make sure to address those when we get to the Q&A. But if, don't hesitate to type a question in the chat um, now so that you don't lose it uh, before, uh, you, before the, we get to the Q&A. Um, and then let me, Hannah, I'm gonna put you. Uh, okay, take it away. Hi, folks. It's great to be here with you all this afternoon. So to really demonstrate what Karen was just talking about, about why it's important to read a case carefully, we're going to walk through a press re release for JM for the case that Karen had just walked through. Now, this example is full of errors. These are errors of our own making. We drafted this. This is not pulled from any press release that was out in 2012 when this case came down. We uh, created these errors. So before I walk through it with you, I want to give folks a minute to just read it, to digest it, um, and then we will come back. So let's start now, and I'm going to set my timer for a minute, and then we will reconvene. It's about a minute. And while you were reading, feel free, you know, to jot down any any notes that you had, any errors that that you spotted. Um, and certainly if you see errors that we don't call out, we would also love, love to hear about that. Um, so please also make note of that. Feel free to put it in the chat or just in your own notes. So to begin, I want to focus on the headline here. Children cannot be incarcerated with adults, Pennsylvania court holds. So the reason why I call attention to this headline as being, an er as being an error is that it is overly broad. And because it is overly broad, it mischaracterizes the holding in JM. So the holding is not that children can never be in a county jail, for example, where an adult might be, 
but rather that a child who is adjudicated delinquent, who subsequently violates probation after turning 18, but is under 21, cannot be held in those um, in that sort of facility. Now, certainly uh, as an advocate, I love this headline. I wish it were true. Um, I would be very ecstatic if I saw it. But unfortunately, it is not quite accurate, and therefore it mischaracterizes the holding and is misleading. So that is first on the headline. And we're going to return to this idea of mischaracterizing the holding later on in this piece. So the second error, and I imagine folks caught this, is that the Court of Common Pleas is not the court that issued this ruling. The court that issued this was a Superior Court of Pennsylvania, which is an intermediate appellate court here in Pennsylvania. And the reason why I bring that out is because, as Karen pointed out, if you were just quickly going through the case and you just read that background in the beginning, which is not a part of the court opinion, you would see the Court of Common Pleas. However, that is the trial court. And in Pennsylvania, the Court of Common Pleas is the trial court, the Superior Court of Pennsylvania is the Intermediate Appellate Court, and then you have the Supreme Court being the highest court here in the Commonwealth. And most states are gonna follow a very similar structure as I imagine a lot of you know, but the reason why I call this out, in part, make sure you are you are in fact paying close attention to the name of the court and making sure that the name of the court is actually um, the correct court. But also to note that just because you have a Supreme Court, for example, does not mean it is the highest court in that state. I'm gonna call out New York for a moment for that. So New York, it does have a Supreme Court. However, in New York, unlike in Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court is that state's trial court. So just because it says Supreme Court does not mean it's the highest court. So just make sure to pay attention to that annoying nuance um, that for whatever reason, that is the, the name um, that New York has called its trial court. Um, uh, next slide. So here, I don't know about you all, but when I read this first sentence, it is rather clunky. And so the error here that I want to point out is that it is mirroring the clunky language of the court case itself, of the opinion issued by the court. And it's not wrong, certainly, it's literally pulled from the case. However, the reason why I am identifying it as an error is because it is really difficult to parse. And court cases are often difficult to parse, as Karen mentioned, sometimes lawyers, judges, they, you know, the court, they toss in language to, you know, sound fancy and smart, um, and it, but it, it makes it really hard to read. And so, although it is important to be precise, to accurately capture what the court is saying, you should not feel wed to the court's exact language. It is tricky, I will say, as a lawyer myself, to try to take apart this language, to simplify it, to put it in your own words. That is a challenge, and that is also a challenge for lawyers as well. This is not unique to the comms world. Lawyers struggle with this as well. But as a lawyer reading this, I go, what are you saying? <laughs> um, so just keep that in mind in your framing. You don't have to pull directly from the court opinion. Think about how you might simplify it a little bit. The next piece I wanna pull out is how we talk about the court and the verbs that we use to talk about the court. So here um, it says, Judge Christine Donahue argued. So the issue here is that the court and judges don't argue. Judges hold, they find, they reason, they conclude, they do not argue. So that's just a, a verb I'd want you to kind of throw out when you're talking about the court or, or a judge, for example, if you're talking about a trial court opinion and they are arguing, just keep that in mind. They are not arguing. That's not what they're doing. Now, the reason why also Judge Christine Donahue is highlighted here is that because this was a superior court opinion here in Pennsylvania, the, the appellate court is a panel of judges. So it wasn't just Judge Donahue who was on, that, on, on the court as a single judge. She was writing on behalf of the court. So writing for the court, that is totally, that is fine, that is accurate. But something that lawyers, the norm is, we tend not to like to personalize the judges who are on the court. So rather we say the court helped, the court concluded, the court reasoned versus signaling out the individual judge who wrote. And there certainly are exceptions to that. For example, talking about the US Supreme Court, we oftentimes do call out the individual 
um, justices, but that is kind of its own bucket, its own little world. And the final thing, again, I, I mentioned, I, I promised we'd, we would return to the mischaracterization of the case as we did with, with the headline here in talking about the Juvenile Act, it's unambiguous that a court cannot send a child to an adult detention facility. And so the reason why, again, this is an error is that it's mischaracterizing the holding of the case. That is not what the Juvenile Act says, and that is certainly not what Judge Donahue, writing on behalf of the court, is saying. That is not what the court held. And so just ensuring that you're paying close attention to the language of the court um, and, and ensuring that you are not mischaracterizing um, the holding. Just one small note on that, because some of you might be puzzling a little bit, saying, I thought that kind of was that language that Karen read. Doesn't it say just basically that? And I think that that's sort of the, the point we're trying to emphasize a little bit, because um, it is extremely close to the holding. And yet you'll likely have the lawyers in your office pulling out the hair a little bit if you were to write this, because there's a huge category or a, a category we wish were much smaller in Pennsylvania, um, but of situations where, where children are in fact sent to adult facilities and that's when they're tried as adults. And then they don't meet the definition of child under the Juvenile Act, according to Pennsylvania, even if they're much younger in fact than, than age 18. Um, and so there's the, the lack of precision in this sentence is what creates the error. There's a variety of ways you can fix it, which I think maybe I, I should stop there because I think Hannah may be about to show them to you. Um, but just if you're sitting here like, wait a second, that sounds a lot like the language. You're absolutely right. And what we're emphasizing here is just the, the need for precision, especially when characterizing the holding um, because of the risk of, of a small, slight difference in language or a slight error, um, making it inaccurate in a way that, it, that will cause lawyers to, uh, to uh, panic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is, that is absolutely right. And again, I mean, I think, you know, and part of it is the the unambiguous, you know, you want to find that word, that phrase that's easily quotable. But the issue here is that in doing that in this in that particular sentence is that it does become misleading. Again, it's mischaracterizing the whole day. So up here is a, I'm going to put it in quotation marks, a model press release. Um, again, it's something that we drafted. Um, it's designed to address the errors that I just identified in the quote unquote bad press release. But again, it is a model. It is not perfect. Um, I imagine that some of you may be reading it and think, I would word it differently. Um, that is totally fine. The point here is that this is designed to kind of parallel this other press release and to actually accurately capture the language, the holding, um, and to not say the court argued, um, for example. And so this will be on the slides that we share. Um, and so I know we, we are short on time, so we do need to move on to the next slide, but have no fear, um, this will be in, in your toolkit. So I just want to quickly run through just some of the takeaways from what um, we just talked about. Again, the key thing is just being very um, precise with the key details. So that means the court name, the party names, the terminology for JM for the case we went through. We didn't get into the party names that wasn't you know relevant to you know um, to the particular piece that we went through. But you know if if that is relevant, you know make sure that you are in fact accurately characterizing those names and um, and, and ensuring that. Again, the overgeneralizations do, do, do try to avoid that, um, especially about the holding. We saw that in a couple of different places in the press release, one in the headline and again in the body of it. Um, and again, it's, just, it's, it's misleading and it's, and it's falsely stating what the holding of the case is, which is not what we want. In actually reading the case itself, you know, look look for the holding, look for the main takeaways. Um, they're at the beginning, they're at the end, and sometimes they will not be as well written at the beginning. They'll be better stated at the end. Um, and just, just so just keep that in mind. Um, as Karen noted from the very beginning of the case for JM, it was a little unclear what was going on. But then once you got to the end and the holding is restated, it becomes a little bit clearer. So just keep that in mind and, and don't get, give up on the case. Um, for the most helpful reasoning, certainly the application section is going to be what is I, is the most interesting. After you kind of are parsing through the legalese, you're actually going to start, the court's going to start applying the law to the facts. And that's really going to be the, the meat of the case that you want to focus on. And finally, just in talking about the court or talking about the judge in the case of an individual judge, 
just remember the verbs that you use. You know, the judges reason, they hold, they find. They are not arguing. Um, and that's very important. That's a simple thing, a simple, you know, change you can make um, in your writing on, on cases. Thank you, Hannah. Um, uh, and uh, I'm so I, I'm going to pause for just a minute if folks have any questions um, related to this segment, because we're going to move to working with lawyers. Um, so if there's anything burning question you want answered right now, I can take a moment uh, and, and answer that in the chat box, or you can um, just make a note of it on a piece of paper and we can address it in the um, Q&A later. But just one quick pause before I switch topics. All right, moving along. Um, okay, so working with lawyers. We're, we lawyers are, are known for certain things. I don't think that being really great uh, folks to work with is necessarily high on the, the list, although that I shouldn't speak as such a generalization. Obviously, many people, I think, are, are, many of us are wonderful individuals. Sometimes it can be a very, uh, uh, there can be um, difficulties that can make it a challenge. In particular, I think, um, working with lawyers in high pressure settings uh, where messaging information out uh, is, is, the, is the goal. And so I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what I mean by that. Um, and we're going to do this, as I mentioned at the start, through uh, by talking about what we've identified as, as three thorny issues that occasionally come up uh, when working with when lawyers and communications professionals are working together. Um, and I'm sure there are more, and we can talk about those if you want to during the Q and A. Um, and again, they're they're a little bit um, we're lumping a few things together in some of these different issues for the in, in, in the interest of um, uh, efficiency. So the first one um, I alluded to already is uh, the, the pace of things, right? The need for speed. Communications is, very often is happening, you know, if you're talking about in, in news media or response, responding to uh, events that are rapidly unfolding, right? That there's often a need for a very quick response time. Um, so here are a few scenarios that are um, not quite so hypothetical, perhaps things that might have happened to me uh, when I was working at Juvenile Law Center, uh, where uh, there's a outreach to our communications director or communications staff um, from somebody in the, in the news media or, or in, in the um, the media world. So maybe a reporter calling wanting a quote. Um, so it's a, a court decision that just came down, not a case that, that we were necessarily working on, but one that um, the reporter thinks we might want to comment on. Uh, perhaps a radio station or a TV station wanting an interview, right? You know, we were doing a panel on such and such topic and we'd love one of your professionals or your, your experts to come talk about this X topic. Um, or maybe a reporter calling about a case that the that I'm actually working on. So you know, a monitoring report um, in a in a, a a case that's under a consent decree, for example, um, and wanting a comment, wanting wanting to know whether we want to opine on that for a story. Um, and so you might uh, get this inquiry from the reporter and turn around and send it by email to your uh, legal team or the lawyer on the uh, the staff. And you might get uh, some different reactions, right? You might get the panicked attorney. Oh my gosh, what are you talking about? I have to add this to my to-do list today. I have so much going on. I can't possibly do this right now. Um, or, you know, oh, I don't think I can talk to that reporter. I don't know anything about that topic. Or I've known a little bit, but I'd have to spend five hours getting up to speed to be able to, to, to give a coherent interview. Um, so that's the, the on the left scenario. Um, or you might get uh, crickets, right? You might send something hoping you know that a, needs a really quick turnaround and just nothing comes back to your desk and you're like, what is going on? Do they not understand that this is important and time sensitive? Um, so I'm going to try to unpack just a little bit why you might get those responses, not defending them, not saying that they're reasonable, but just helping to kind of understand what's going on in that non-responsive or panicky lawyer's head. Um, so one thing is just, you know, lawyers do often have a lot on their plate. Like many other people, this is not unique in any way to lawyers, um, but often it is just, it's like the to-do list is extremely long. There's a lot of moving pieces and, and something is being plopped down uh, in an urgent way and, and that causes a stressful reaction. That's that's sort of more, more just a human thing than a lawyer specific thing. Um, a more lawyer specific thing is that, you know, law is a profession dominated by deadlines and often a sense of urgency. And often that is very real urgency and time sensitivity. And other times there can be things that are presented as being urgent and time sensitive that in fact are not necessarily that. And so there's a little bit of, you know, lawyers having to kind of sort through, okay, this this is coming to my desk sounding urgent, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm truly, does it really demand the, the, the kind of quick turnaround? Um, you know, I've certainly gotten emails in my inbox marked, marked as urgent that, that did not at all necessitate that. And so you sort of start to put up filters a little bit sometimes. And so um, it may be that 
rightly or wrongly, lawyers are filtering uh, or having that filtered response to, to a, something that's presented as a really urgent matter. Um, and then I think the biggest one, frankly, is that lawyers fret a lot about language, right? It's uh, like communications professionals. This is something we absolutely have in common, right? The uh, written word is a huge tool of our trade. And so we, we, we care about it. We spend a lot of time on it. Um, but communications messaging is not the type of, of of written word that we're that comfortable in. And so it's sort of asking a lawyer to do something that they care about, but don't necessarily feel that good at the specific type of writing or the specific type of messaging that you're asking them. And so that also kind of creates this like, oh gosh, I have to, you know, it just, it, it doesn't necessarily, what, what might feel like not that heavy of an ask might land in a little bit more of a loaded way for the lawyer, because again, they, they really, they care about language a lot themselves and this is not their element exactly. So what do you do? Um, so one, the first possible solution that I have is one that I also use a lot in parenting. Um, those of you who have children on the line might have heard this in the setting too, right? Present options. And this is true even if one of the options is like patently not a very good option. But if you present to a colleague, you know, what the choices are as opposed to we've got to do this now, we've got to respond to this reporter now. If you present it as what, you know, what as two options, so, you know, the alter what's the alternative to not doing that? Um, you're more likely to perhaps get a get a response and maybe also get a response that's a little bit less harried or upset. Um, and so uh, my example up here, right, is, is this is the first one is meant to be the kind of one of these is, is bad. We wouldn't want to not comment on the story is what my sort of assumption is, is, is like this is not there's a story that's going to run on an issue we care about. We'd want to be part of that. Um, but naming that to the attorney, right, we could give this this reporter a call back ASAP or we could choose to sit this one out and not have a comment in the story, the attorney might see, okay, well, we definitely don't want to do that latter one. So, okay, this is now on my to-do list for today. The second example is more of a, of a real menu of options, right? Um, we could agree to speak to him briefly this afternoon before his deadline. Um, or if you don't have time for that, we could draft, we could see if a written statement might be okay. We could maybe send a quote instead of doing a full interview. Um, and that might be a, a genuine set of options. Um, and one of them may be more or less appealing to the attorney. Um, the second suggestion I have is to be precise about time sensitivity. This is sensitivity. This is to avoid that filter effect of the lawyer being like, okay, yeah, everything sounds urgent. I'm not going to stress about this particular thing. Um, so instead of just saying, this is urgent, I need, I need your attention right now, just be precise, right? The reporter likely needs an answer before his 1 p.m. deadline or her 1 p.m. deadline, right? Just, just name it. Um, that will uh, convey the sense of urgency, uh, assuming that 1 p.m. Is, is, is in the near future here, um, without necessarily um, getting filtered out as, as more noise. Um, and then I think the biggest one, the most helpful suggestion um, that I can give you guys is solving the blank page problem. And this gets at the lawyer's worry, the, the, the fact that we care a lot about words and language. Um, but might struggle to draft a quote or, or, or find the right messaging for a media communication. Um, if you put something on the page for us and say, how does this sound? Uh, lawyers love to pull out the editing pen, right? Like that will send us immediately into like, oh, wait a second, that's not how I would say it. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to change that, right? And you've overcome what is often the biggest hurdle, which is the, oh my gosh, I have to come up with something. Um, and so I think, you know, even if, you know, you can, there's a variety of ways to do that. This obviously depending on your relationship with the particular person, right? If you have a strong sense of what the person might want to say, you can just you know, try drafting a quote. If you don't, you know, saying to the person, if you could give me just a general concept of what you might want to say, I can try to put some words on paper for you um, and then you can edit it. Um, or what's happened to me sometimes that's worked really nicely is drafting everything except the quoted material that you need specifically from me. Um, so there's a story or there's a blog that's there. And then it feels like I'm editing as opposed to just coming up with something to add in the language that would be the quoted material from, from the lawyer, from me. Um, so all of those things can be very helpful techniques. I know it puts the burden more on the communication staff. Obviously you have then the blank page to worry about. Um, and, and I certainly appreciate that that's, uh, that's, a, that's a burden, right? That's, that's part of why it, it can it can produce such a reaction in, in the attorneys. So I appreciate that it's not a cost-free suggestion for you all. All right, and now I'm gonna hand it back to Hannah for thorny issue number two. Let me spotlight you, Hannah. Hey, so the next issue or, or the, there, there's this real tension in, in the law where there's the need to protect case, client, confidentiality, but also the very real reality that stories are powerful and including them in reporting um, can be a really smart 
um, an impactful choice. So I just want to give a little bit of context on why a lawyer may be hesitant to share a personal story, for example, in an active case. One is that sometimes a lawyer may decide because of strategy that it is not a good idea for them to talk to the press. And that is a strategy call that the individual lawyer has made um, possibly in conversation with the client. And the client may have also said to the lawyer, please don't share this information. Um, and so it is the lawyer's responsibility to protect the client attorney confidentiality. Um, and so that is an obligation that we are are, are bound by. Um, and it's also, you know, very, very possible um, in active litigation that there is just some information that simply cannot be shared. It is under seal. Um, the court has required that certain information not be shared. And so the lawyer is not trying to be cagey or maybe sensitive for not releasing that information, but there actually may be a very real reason um, that that information is not public information or is, the lawyer is not willing to provide that as public information. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about in, on the next slide about some of the possible solutions for that. But before we do that, I wanna talk about another inherent tension. And this is a tension that is very, very real for lawyers as we write, as we, whether it's a brief um, or a legal memo, um, as I think it's also very real as well um, in, in the comms world. And the point is that language really matters and the language that we choose really matters because it shapes how we are reading the story, how we are under understanding the people who are profiled in the story. So on the one hand, there is the legally precise word of juvenile. In our work, we talk about the juvenile system, juvenile justice system, juvenile legal system. Yet there's something about that word that doesn't feel quite right as, as an advocate. It's a word that courts use, that the legal system uses to describe young people. But it is the word that courts recognize. Um, and therefore, as a lawyer, you may think, I should use that word because that's what the court is maybe looking for. Then there's the understandable kind of language, um, the, the sympathetic language of child or children. Again, this is specifically in talking about young people. But there's something that's also maybe not quite right about there. You know, you may have a client, for example, the lawyer may have a client and who is 17. Uh, legally, they are under 18, they're a child, but they may not like to be referred to as a child. Um, and so again, the lawyer is also wrestling with this language as well in their own writing. And then there's the advocacy or kind of mission oriented language of young person. And you probably heard me. I kept going back to young person. That is the turn of phrase that I like to use. Um, I, I also don't. This is a personal preference. I tend to shy away from the word youth as well. Um, that's just a personal preference of mine. Again, that's a, a word that I find that the courts use a lot. Um, maybe not quite as egregious in my view as, as juvenile and talking about young people. But again, it's these are these are choices um, that, that are made. So in terms of the solutions um, to how do we kind of navigate these inherent tensions? So the one is for the need for confidentiality. You know, certainly, um, you know, one idea is that you may go to an attorney and you may ask for certain information and the attorney says, I'm not willing to share that. Um, no explanation, that's totally fine. Now you could potentially go to a referral resource. And, you know, that might be a sister organization of the organization where the attorney works, and they may not be able, they're not going to provide you personal stories about that current case, but they may have similar stories about that kind of case. Unfortunately, in our line of work, um, we hear a lot of similar stories. Um, and so even though every case is unique in its own respect, there are patterns. And so consider as well, you know, kind of you reach out to one organization, is there another organization doing similar work that may have another angle or may have a story to provide? Um, and that also goes to even as the organization, who are those resources? So having those internal conversations within your organization about if we're not comfortable talking about a particular case, about a particular issue at this time, is there another organization that may be better suited to that because of where we are in our current litigation? Um, another another point is to put, and this is really on the language point, is to put guidelines in writing. And this is these are internal 
documents. Um, so at Juvenile Law Center, we have an internal style guide, and that's used by certainly our comms department, but also by lawyers um, and anyone else on our staff. So it's the language that we use in public facing documents, but also on our own personal social media um, and kind of, you know, we don't we don't like to use the word juvenile, even though it, it is in our name. <laughs> we recognize that. Um, but you know, you know, being really conscious about our language choices. But that is all kind of around these internal conversations that or organizations are having. And those are conversations between comms folks, lawyers, other staff. Um, and that is ultimately kind of get ahead of these tricky, sticky, conversations ahead of time. So when there ha happens to be an issue that you may want to comment on or language you want to use, you kind of already work through some of those questions. Um, certainly not everything will be solved in advance, unfortunately, um, but you can at least get a little bit on, on, on top of it. Um, those are just a couple of, of ideas, but I think the big takeaway is just having those conversations up front, developing those internal documents to really get ahead of the conversation. Thanks, Anna. Um, and that brings me to thorny issue number three, role definition. Um, so this is a, a bit of a catch-all for different forms of ambiguity about who's doing what on the team and who's the, who the deciders are. Um, so there's some you know, question often about kind of who's the final approver, right? Is it is it ultimately the, the legal head, the head of the legal team on this issue, or is it the head of the communications team? Is it both? You know, who has to sign off um, before something goes out the door? Um, and then kind of relatedly, who has to read it before it goes out the door? Um, what I've often found is that the, the head person on the legal team who's, who ultimately needs to sign off for purposes of making sure that a message fits with the mission, is, jives with the overall legal strategy, that person may not be the person steeped in the facts of the case, right? Like that might not be the person who wrote the brief or really knows uh, the moving parts. And so it may be that before something goes out the door, it needs to be read both by the highest person on the, the team and also by the by the author, by the person who's most in the trenches, who might be one of the more junior people on the team, but they're going to be the one that corrects when you get the party name wrong or a detail, a relevant legal detail, right? So for factual accuracy, think of, you know, think about who needs to read it to ensure accuracy versus who needs to read it to ensure that it's on brand, on message, um, fits with overall legal strategy. And then what does that apply to? Does that, do those kind of standards, does, does the, that kind of approval process go for, you know, for everything, for tweets um, or just for things like op-eds or blogs? What about something that's written in somebody's individual capacity versus something that is going out with, with sort of full organizational branding? Or is there such a distinction at your organization? Um, and then somewhat dif differently, the third piece here, who gets to be the person interviewed or quoted? Um, in, in my experience, sometimes there was a little bit of like, you know, the person who got who got the interview or, or had to had do the interview, depending on your perspective, was the person who was most responsive to email. Um, and that may not be the best uh, situation for in terms of equity concerns, right? Or like fairness within an office about, you know, who's, you know, is there somebody who's particularly working on media skills as part of their professional development plan? Um, so how do we determine who it is that is the quoted attorney or the quoted person um, in a story or the person giving that interview. Um, oh gosh, sorry. Where did my... Ah. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm having a PowerPoint issue here. All right, well, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Going to quickly get back to my slide. Apologies for that. I think it's still there. <laughs> Yeah, okay, there we go, solutions. Um, so similar to what Hannah was just describing, uh, having a process in advance is kind of the best option that, that we came up with for how to, to um, make these decisions uh, in the best possible way, right? So knowing, you know, who is the, who does have to sign off on what types of documents, right? Like that stuff that it's better decided um, in advance and, and having a policy across the office as opposed to having to decide it on, a, um, you know, every time some new thing comes in the door. That being said, because of the, some of the things that we've talked about before about the need for speed and efficiency, um, there, there does need to be some flexibility sometimes in in, um, in the policy, right? So it isn't necessarily that you know one particular individual has to sign off on everything, but maybe um, maybe you define by the type of role, right? The project lead um, is going to be the sign off, and who who that is might vary and might need to be determined at the beginning of a project. Um, and it could also be something like there's a communications point person that is established at the start of a case or the start of a project. 
project um, and who that is, you know, may or may not, you know, this level of seniority might be a sort of separate question a little bit there. Um, and that that's the person that then um, helps decide who's going to be the person interviewed or, you know, what, what needs to be, who needs to read what before it goes out the door. Um, and then a, a policy that I, I borrowed from a, a colleague who, who also um, had a, had a, um, a comms department that she worked with regularly as an attorney in her prior capacity. Um, she said what they found to be very effective um, was having a, 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 a expected communication that went out um, before it uh, went. So there's a draft blog. It's it's the authors have determined it's ready to go where they send it to a whole host of people and say anyone who has a comment or would like to read and revise this has until X time to respond with comments. So sort of to be able to, you know, if there are folks that have that would like to weigh in, um, but again, things are moving quickly. Not everybody's available. Um, just being clear about that, about like when, when would you need to respond to be able to weigh in before this will otherwise go out the door. So there's a variety of different ways, um, I think, to design a process. And I'm, I'm very interested, in fact, to hear what suggestions folks on this call have um, about how they've seen this done effectively. Um, but I think the key, the key bottom line, right, is in advance as opposed to when, when the inquiry comes in the door. So we have a few minutes here for, I, I would love to hear folks' ideas, and I'd also be happy to answer any, any questions um, about anything that we've talked about or, or other, folks, other topics on folks' minds. And I see Katie has appeared. So I'm going to mute myself and uh, let and see, see what folks want to say. Yeah, and I just uh, came on in case there are any questions. Um, and just to also add the note that I, I think one thing that has been helpful for me is trying to build relationships and convene uh, meetings and even just one-on-one -on -one conversations with other legal communications professionals to navigate some of this um, and sometimes to vent. <laughs> um, but feel free to put a question in the chat if you have any, or if there's something that you've been dealing with in your work. Um, and folks can also raise hands if you want to, and we can, or, or just unmute if you'd like. Um, so we're happy to do questions orally if that's easier. Oh, that's great to hear. We are also recording this and we'll, uh, Juvenile Law Center will keep this on our YouTube channel. Um, So I saw a question, we'll definitely share the PowerPoint. Um, and then I see a question about the best way for comp staff to understand the legal work or work of the organization. Um, I'm happy to weigh in, but I, I, I'm tempted first, Katie, to ask you to, if you have advice on that as a person <coughs> who I think is, has done that really effectively at Juvenile Law Center, as you start, you know, the kind of breaking down the silos sometimes that exist between communications and, and, and legal teams. But I'm happy to take it if, if you'd like, but I want to give you that moment. Well, I will, I will say that one thing that was helpful for me when I started at the job was I did spend a day in both family court and juvenile court, which was really helpful to me to get a sense of those court systems. And I've also gone on trips with our attorneys, including one trip to uh, a Supreme Court um, hearing. That, that was very helpful. But we have something called litigation case rounds in our office that I try to sit in where all of the lawyers uh, go over what they're working on. And we um, we do that on a you know regular basis. Uh, that's been a great tool for our office, um, and also just trying whenever I can to put ticklers in my in my files to say hey check with them. But that doesn't mean I don't sometimes miss. Oh, they did file this today. Uh, so it's a uh, making sure you know which cases your team is working on that that could be um, good ones for press also helps we have a lot that we can't necessarily because something is sealed or um yeah um, I, see, I see other question about um the embargoed copies oh yeah and well and you're probably better suited to that one too but i, I just to chime in to reinforce i think also it, you um Comstaff used to come to, I don't know if this is still the case, frankly, but um, occasionally to the project team meetings, we'd have um, rotating members of the communications team would, would come and be part of those sessions sometimes. And it was also extraordinarily helpful for us attorneys to have the perspective of the communication staff as we were talking about our, our strategies or what's going on on the team at that point. Like, um, I think that, you know, we both benefit from the cross communication, both, both so that we you don't have those situations where something's been filed and, and folks were unaware, but also substantively, right? Like thinking about how to message 
a particular issue or, or something that the attorneys don't really see um, as being media worthy that the communications folks do see the media appeal or the, the, the strategy that might um, be um, in the way in which we might be able to talk about that case in a way that advance the, advances the broader mission of the organization. Um, but yeah, do you want to talk, uh, Katie, about embargoed uh, documents? Yeah, I can talk. Um, we've had a couple of really good experiences with that. And I have a pretty high bar for really trusting the reporter. Uh, also, it, you know, one thing that I've noticed is if you if you are going to just give an embargoed copy, you you can't mislead the reporter about how many people you're giving it to. They don't want to think they're the only one and then find out they were one of five, for example. If they are going to be one of five, that's okay too, but they just need to know. Um, it, it's a way, it will really burn a bridge. Um, we have also had timing issues with that when we've had sort of major class actions and we have given enough of the um, embargoed copy to a reporter that they can write the whole piece, but we really don't want them to hit publish on it until we get it um, and maybe the lawyers can tell the, the stamp or <laughs> get it. See now, yeah, I don't know. we can't have the news story go out when it hasn't been filed yet. When it hasn't been filed, stamped. And it I know, filed. and yeah. and so we, you know, we have had situations where the story is all written, it's ready to go. The in this case, it was when we filed our lawsuit with Glenn Mills, and you know, we were doing a press conference, and the Inquirer was going to have it as its cover story of the paper. And I'm standing there because we can't, they can't turn it on until we say, okay, now it's filed. Um, so those those can be kind of stressful, but as long as everyone's clear about what needs to happen and what the timing uh, will look like. Um, and, and that, I think it, it so helps to understand where, e like those are stressful moments and I'm not sure that there's a way to avoid them or make them totally stress-free moments, right? It's these the heat of the filing of a, yeah. of a case at the same time that there's media coverage. And yet, I think knowing why each side, each, each party involved is, is a little bit stressed out and respecting the, the place that they're coming from, right? Like that, that for the lawyer, the file, you can't, it, it would be a disaster, right? If something hasn't actually been filed for that to be hitting the press, right? So, um, yes. and, and it can be a real challenge to get a document over the finish line to the to the format that it needs to be to, to file it, right? Like that's that's um, sort of uh, the primary thing the lawyer is going to be worried about is the state of the, the document when it's filed. Um, and and the then lastly, so the lawyers need to understand that when an embargoed copy has been sent over and there's a story ready to go, that that's why, why that's uh, the, kind of the equivalent <laughs> for the communications folks. Yes, yes. And, and also just to, you know, impress upon your legal colleagues that you are what you are doing what you're trying to do to help advance their work um i i sort of said listen we need to figure this out i have the front page of the inquirer as soon as we get this so um and that will help you know judges and justices are human beings that are not impervious to what cultural conversations are happening what what public opinion is what chatter is so all right, I see we're at one o'clock. So thank you so much, uh, both Katie to you and to Juvenile Law Center for hosting for the webinar um, and to all of the attendees for your attention and your great questions. And I, and I hope it's been helpful to folks. And uh, just stay tuned. We'll, we can send out the PowerPoint as well as um, we'll be posting this um, if you had any colleagues who you think might like it but didn't get to uh, participate. And I, uh, I'll just put also my contact in the chat um, if you have any ideas for other kinds of trainings or sessions like this, it is something that we want to offer more of or things that you think we could learn from. So that's my email. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.